Thank you to everyone joining us today from across the country and around the world. I'm Kim Todd, Virtual Programs Manager here at Conscious Capitalism, Inc. Uh, on behalf of the entire CCI team, we appreciate you taking the time to learn and grow in community with us. Today, we are excited to welcome Jose Ruiz, the CEO and Managing Partner at Alder Coton and the President of IMD International Search Group, to share his insight and experience into what it takes to build and cultivate successful employee-employer relationships founded in trust and explore best practices for navigating the evolving recruitment and hiring landscape. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business, as well as a movement of business leaders from around the world, working to change the practice and perception of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Conscious Capitalism Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing the movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists through our senior leader network membership and engagement with our local chapters. Several times a month, we offer virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and the business practices of those in our network. Today's gathering will run for about 45 minutes. Jose will share his presentation for about 25 minutes and then we'll transition to audience questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of our session. We encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible during our time together. If you have any technical questions or issues, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org. And now I'm honored to introduce Jose Ruiz. As I mentioned before, Jose is the CEO and managing partner at Alder Coton and president of IMD International Search Group. His clients include some of the world's most recognized organizations and investors. In leading his team, Jose partners with clients to help them recruit talent and develop thriving organizations. He is also involved in executive search work focused on board members, CEOs, senior level executives, and consulting engagements related to leadership and organizational effectiveness. He is also a board leadership fellow at the National Association of Corporate Directors and is certified in cybersecurity oversight by Carnegie Mellon University. As a board member of Conscious Capitalism in Mexico and a member of the CCI's Senior Leadership Network in the United States, Jose is part of a global community of business leaders dedicated to elevating humanity through business. Welcome, Jose. We're excited for you to be here with us today. I am going to hand it over to you now for the presentation and, and rejoin you at the end for some open Q&A. Sounds great, Kim. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me well? It's the, uh, the must-ask question in every uh, Zoom and webinar now. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for attending the, uh, the, the webinar. Uh, I would have much liked to be able to see faces and, and make this a bit more uh, interactive. Uh, but if at any time uh, you've got a question, and I would welcome any type of, of intervention, if you put it in the question box in the, in the question box or the chat, uh, either Michael or Kim uh, will be able to, uh, to chime in. So. This this uh, topic of, uh, of trust and the topic of engagement and the topic of uh, what is needed to be able to, uh, to, to attract talent, to be able to uh, get people into the company, buy into the culture, uh, it, uh, it can be broken down into many very difficult and, and complex uh, systems and processes. But we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the, the most uh, simple elements that, that, that can create significant engagement. And uh, just like many uh, situations, this starts with leadership. And as we begin to explore the, uh, uh, the concepts, I uh, just want to make sure that, that, that we're clear on what we define as leadership. So there's, there's three very broad ways in which we can think about leadership. The first is uh, what many people think of, which is leadership by position. This is a type of leadership that if you're in, in a race, uh, then, uh, you know, whoever is in front, that is the leader, uh, a leader by position. You don't really have people that are following you. People are chasing you because they want that uh, leadership position, you know, whether it's in a race and many times, whether it's in a hierarchy or in a company, if it's position, 
don't be fooled. People are chasing you. They want to get to where you are. The, uh, the second uh, type of leadership is the, uh, the leadership by behavior. And uh, this is really what, uh, what many uh, leadership courses and even many coaches kind of uh, push us towards. If, if, uh, if you emulate the behaviors of, of a leader, then uh, you will look like a leader. And I think many of us have, have had these type of experiences where we're actually speaking to somebody and the eye contact is like really intense and they're really pretending like they're listening to the point where it gets really freaky. That's leadership behaviors that are really not uh, living the, uh, the true leadership. The leadership that we're going to talk about is a relationship. And what makes it uh, important is that uh, it, 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 it's not just up to you to be a leader when it's leadership by relationship. As a matter of fact, the only one that can write you leadership in a relationship is somebody that decides to follow you. If nobody is following you, then you're really not, uh, not leading anybody. Uh, but as with any other relationship, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we need to take into consideration and trust is at the core of uh, that relationship. So we're going to be talking a lot about trust, and we're also going to be talking into a little bit of, of, of science, uh, neurobiology, and uh, why uh, the, uh, the element of trust is not something that's just emotional. There is some biology behind it, and uh, there is a lot of science behind it. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, and uh, we're going to go through a couple of, of uh, slides. And the first question that I would want to ask you guys is, if you were not here, if you could be doing anything, you know, what would you be doing? And when I ask this question in, in a live audience, uh, you know, people start raising their hands. And one of the first answers is always, I'd be at the beach with a drink, or I would be at the park playing with my kids. And yes, those are wonderful things that, uh, that, that we all like doing. Uh, but then my next question is, okay, how many hours, how many days, or maybe how many weeks or months would you sincerely tolerate just lying on the beach, doing nothing and drinking? Or very truthfully, how many hours or days could you be at the park with your children and uh, really enjoying yourself? And the, uh, the, the true answer is that uh, the, the, the thing that really makes life significant for us is meaningful work. And we're going to get a lot into uh, what the, the, the concept of uh, meaningful work is, uh, but that's really what it comes down to, meaningful work, being able to, uh, to, 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 to have this feeling that, number one, we are clear about what is expected of, the, of us. Number two, feel that, uh, that what we're doing is challenging, important, and valuable. And number three, that we get to decide and, and this is critical because if, if, if we're not doing something challenging, if we're not deciding for ourselves, then it's not meaningful work. And it's important to not confuse just meaningful work with your job or what you do at what we call our work because uh, it, it, it's ideal that you do meaningful work at your job, but there are people who actually do not do meaningful work at their job, but they do meaningful work at home, uh, you know, teaching their children, uh, if you're uh, if you're building something and you like uh, building things, then that's meaningful work. And ideally, what you want as a leader is to be able to provide people with as much meaningful work as possible. And this is what uh, what what uh, what's the beginning of being able to find a relationship of, uh, relationship of trust that allows you to really be able to help others to provide uh, meaningful work. Now, there's a uh, uh, a very popular concept, and I'm sure you've you've heard it. And uh, I think that it's it's one of the, uh, the 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 most overutilized and less truthful con concepts out there in management uh, that is empowering. You know, people say, yeah, you have to empower people, you have to empower your employees, you have to empower your children. Uh, it's it's not correct simply because if I need you to grant me power, you're really not giving me any power because you can take it away. So really meaningful work and empowerment, we have to find ourselves. And the challenge of leadership is making sure that there's the right context so that people can empower themselves and so that people can actually be able and perform meaningful work. So that's the, uh, the, the core concept. 
One concept that has been very common uh, with the, the conscious capitalism ecosystem in the, uh, the past few years has been, has been the concept of flow. Uh, that, uh, you know, it, 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 it's become popular through Mihai Shiks and Mihai, uh, but it, uh, as, as I'll get into it, it it's, it's not exactly something that is, that is totally new. Uh, but Mihai describes the concept of flow as, uh, as that state uh, of, 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 of consciousness uh, where you feel your best and you perform your best. Uh, in, in, in his book, he describes this, this being in flow as the moments where you're so focused and so concentrated that uh, time is just uh, passing by and that you actually lose track of time. And there is a neurobiological reason why you lose track of time. Uh, and uh, that's because when you are in flow, there are certain uh, parts of your brain that kind of focus the energy on where it is that you're, uh, you're concentrated. And uh, it does actually kind of turn off uh, that uh, part of the back of your brain that is uh, keeping track of time among other things. Uh, so it's uh, it, this concept of flow is one of the things that, that we want to be able to help others to achieve as leaders. So let's, let's dig deeper into this and uh, dig deeper into these, these basic concepts that I just described of neurobiology that, uh, that are behind the, the state of flow. So there was actually a, a study uh, from McKinsey and uh, it's referenced in, in a couple of, of uh, Harvard Business Review articles that uh, over a 10 year study, McKinsey discovered that people in flow are actually five times more productive. This is not 5%, 25%, this is 5X. Now put this into perspective, that this actually means that if you show up for work on Monday and you are in flow, you can go home for the rest of the week. That's, that's the, uh, the, the impact. Uh, of course, you know, it, would be, uh, uh, it would be great if, uh, if it were that easy to be able to, uh, to stay in flow and be able to, uh, to, to work consistently in flow. And it's probably impossible, but that's the level of impact. If we could only aspire to do a, a couple of X or even a significant uh, percentage, uh, that would be a, 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 an awesome game. So I'm gonna go back to the, uh, the, the slide that I showed you where I was telling you about meaningful work. And uh, I'm gonna highlight some of these, uh, these words. So the first one, you know, it's to be clear about what is expected of us, uh, and being clear and transparent about what's expected of us is something that is critical uh, to, to, to be able to have trust. To feel that what we're doing is challenging, important, and valuable. You know, this is the word challenging is critical uh, because if something is not challenging, even if it's, if it's clearly spelled out, and if, even if it's important and valuable, if it does not challenge us, it will not help us grow, and we will not be able to achieve that sense of, of growth. And then the third component is that we actually be able to uh, decide for ourselves. Those are three key words that we're going to uh, dig uh, deeper into. And this is something that uh, you have probably seen many, many times. And uh, this is at the center of flow. And this is at the center of leadership. We forget it, but we will uh, dig deeper into why there is an element of physiological needs in what we're doing in leadership, why there is a very important element of satisfying our safety, why belonging and being able to be challenged and giving the respect of being handed something that is important as a task is important to min uh, uh, meaningful work, the self-esteem and the recognition of the work that we're doing, and at the very top, the self-actualization the desire to become the most that we can be. There's no coincidence that these things are here. And believe it or not, this Maslow pyramid of needs is at the core of being able to do meaningful work. And it's important that we remember these. And uh, I've got some questions on, on the chat. I'm gonna see if uh, uh, there's something there that uh, needs to be answered. I think, uh, I think we're good. So I've got one from Eric and, and we'll get back to, uh, to, to that uh, uh, later on. So let's, uh, let's talk about a conflict that, uh, that we live with pretty much throughout our lives. Uh, this is something that, uh, that comes in the minute that, uh, that we're born. 
and uh, we we get challenged by it uh, almost absolutely every day. And that conflict is the, uh, the the need for certainty and being able to trust someone uh, so blindly that we can actually you know place ourselves in their arms the way that, uh, that that we place ourselves in our mother's arms. And then you know it's 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 metaphor when we say uh, place ourselves in 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 somebody else's arms. But that is a, uh, a need that we carry throughout our lives. Uh, the need for certainty in a way is being able to, uh, to detach ourselves and be able to just trust someone enough uh, to be able to take care of us. And uh, you know, many times we simply describe it as watching our back. Uh, but that's always in conflict with our natural sense of uh, autonomy. And if you go back to Maslow's uh, pyramid, You'll see that uh, the bottom, the red, and the uh, the, the 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 orange, uh, you, you know, they they are this level of care that you would get uh, from security from your mother, uh, and then you know the love and belonging are right there. But when you really want the esteem, when you really want the the desire to become more, that's when the autonomy and 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 the the uh, the, the threshold for less certainty uh, starts to kick in. So this is a, a, a relationship uh, that is a relationship of mutual trust. Uh, once again, going back to this concept that, uh, that leadership is not something that you do in isolation. Uh, leadership is not something that uh, can be detached from a relationship. If we use this very simple uh, example of a child and her mother, uh, the child is trusting mom that uh, they're being kept safe and mom is granting a certain amount of trust to the child to be able to go out there and explore and be on their own make certain decisions be able to uh, to to get creative to use their imagination and this is just a very very basic example of this situation of mutual trust uh, but as we build our friendships and as we build our relationships, we just keep going back between these two. Uh, you know, what is it that uh, as a uh, as a boss, uh, what is that structure of certainty uh, that you're providing your employees versus what is that space of uh, uncertainty uh, that you are providing to be able to allow employees to exercise creativity, to be able to exercise imagination, to be able to solve problems and to be able to grow as they continue to, uh, to, to evolve and uh, solve some of these uh, organizational issues. So mutual trust is at the, uh, at the very, very core of, uh, of, of, of the leadership uh, relationship. So, you know, we mentioned the, uh, the definition of science from uh, Mihai Chicks and Mihai. And uh, that is actually just uh, a, a very recent uh, trend. Uh, it's not from last year, but it, it, it is within the past uh, decade that, that, that Mihai uh, wrote his book. Uh, but flow science uh, in, in other ways that, uh, that it's been known uh, actually dates back to the early 1900s uh, when researchers like uh, William James began documenting the, the ways that the, uh, the brain uh, alters their own consciousness to improve performance. Remember that definition uh, of Mihai of saying, you know, you're so focused that time actually flies by and you don't notice. There is this uh, uh, neurobiologic uh, element that uh, you actually do shift energy from one part of the brain uh, to the other. Uh, Walter uh, Bradford, who was actually James' student, uh, discovered a link between mind and body, and uh, that is what we know as the uh, uh, what we know as the fight or flight uh, response. And uh, this this fight or flight response uh, really helped explain a lot of this uh, amplified uh, performance. So if we take this back and and we overlap it with this concept of of certainty and and uncertainty, there's no way that we're going to be in flow if we are completely in this part of certainty. Uh, we love feeling safe, uh, but eventually uh, safety in humans that do desire more ends up turning into boredom. We would, li we would like to think about being relaxed at the beach and, and having that drink, but at some point, boredom will kick in. And uh, if you're not doing meaningful work, you will find meaningful work, perhaps, uh, you know, surf surfing, learning how to dive, 
uh, or some of these other things that actually even on vacation uh, have to keep us uh, entertained because uh, certainty at 100% is just something that uh, humans do not tolerate. Uh, once we slip into uh, the, that realm of uncertainty, once we start uh, feeling that there's something that uh, represents a challenge, you know, our antennas kind of perk up and then concentration starts kicking in. And at some point uh, we get excited. And at this stage, there are some biological, physiological issues that are, that are happening. You know, our body starts segregating adrenaline and we start getting excited about what it is uh, that we're doing. Uh, that is that uh, ultimate zone of uh, feeling concentrated and, uh, and excited. Now, the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, you know, the child that you see in the picture has a very different threshold of uh, where they're going to stay in flow under uncertainty than probably a nine-year-old who is a bit more confident, who is a bit more willing to take chances, and certainly a teenager that will you know, scare you if, uh, if, if you don't watch out because of their willingness to be able to get excited and, uh, and take chances. That is the threshold of uncertainty. And the importance of, of, of understanding and, and having that very close relationship with people in leadership, uh, understanding that threshold is one of the, uh, the, the most significant things that you can do for the people that you work with. The most significant mistake that you can make is assuming that we can all deal with uncertainty and that we all have different thresholds for when we can be in flow. And the reason is that uh, it's very nice when you look at it from the perspective of being concentrated and being excited. But the fact is that this kicks into high gear and then the, uh, the fight or flight response kicks in when we go over the edge of our tolerance to uncertainty. And then the adrenaline really kicks up. That's when there's, there's cortisone in our, injected into our body. And this is the point where many people define as just being caught like a deer in headlights. Uh, understanding that sweet spot of when somebody is going to be challenged, when they will feel that uh, they're, they're in development, that they're growing, and that very thin line between going from excited into being concerned and consequently into fear is a, uh, one of the most significant things that you need to be able to uh, identify as a leader. Once again, this is where that equation of trust lies because people that are working under a certain structure that you are granting, providing the baseline certainty and the anchor for them to feel certain stepping into the area of uncertainty is really what, uh, what, what, uh, what, what they, you are trusting them and they are trusting you with. So this element is very critical. So in the end, really the, uh, the, the, the two questions that we should be asking uh, when it comes to trust is how much uncertainty and, and how much ambiguity can we tolerate? And uh, secondly, for how long? Because we can step into fight or flight for a couple of minutes, maybe a couple of hours. You stay there and that is very close to the definition of uh, a burnout. So going back to the, uh, the, 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 the importance of recognizing uh, what this is, uh, you know, going back to the, uh, the, the neurobiology of, of fight or flight, uh, it is an efficiency exchange. Uh, we're actually trading the energy that's used for higher uh, cognitive functions uh, and using that energy for a heightened attention and, uh, and awareness. So, you know, think about uh, you know, doing a crossword puzzle and being able to focus on that very interesting crossword puzzle in your living room with a cup of coffee on a Sunday morning. Uh, versus having somebody just drop you in a jungle without knowing what's going on and then trying to focus on the, uh, on the crossword puzzle. Uh, that's somewhat of a uh, harsh analogy, uh, but in many circumstances, there's many uh, work situations uh, that are the equivalent of, of being dropped into a jungle and mitigating our ability to be able to operate at the, uh, the cognitive level that we might be capable of uh, because uh, our, our attention and our awareness is, is being focused somewhere else. So in flow, the attention heightens 
and uh, the, uh, the 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 same energy is is channeled and 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 it's uh, it's going into uh, the processing side uh, of solving whatever it is that we're solving, and that's where we go far faster, and we start favoring the more the more efficient processing of uh, the uh, the subconscious intrinsic uh, system. So you've got those two sides. Uh, if if you are covered with a basic feeling of trust. Uh, then that's when you have this opportunity to be in flow, to be able to operate at a 5x uh, efficiency uh, versus being on the back end of that, uh, not uh, not feeling trust, and then dropping into being more concerned about what's happening around you than the task uh, that you have uh, at hand. And, uh, you know, most recently, in, in, in I, I think I'm showing my age when I talk about 2008 being most most uh, most recent uh, but yeah, it's been it's been a few years now. But anyway, 2008, uh, the 90s were just a couple of uh, years ago for me. 2008, John Hopkins, uh, neuroscience, uh, neuroscientist, uh, Charles Lim, uh, used the functional MRI to scan the brains of, uh, of improv jazz musicians that were in flow. And uh, Lim found that uh, the area of the brain best known for self-monitoring uh, actually deactivated. And self-monitoring is really that voice of doubt, uh, the one that, uh, that is the internal person that defeats us, uh, the, uh, the, the very, very critical inner critic that we carry. And uh, since, since flow is a fluid state, uh, you know, where problem solving is nearly automatic, second guessing is really one of those things that, uh, that really works against us. So it, uh, in, in, in being in flow and being able to be so focused and even being able to, to, to trust us, ourselves, uh, allows us to be able to turn off the, uh, the, the self-monitoring. Uh, so now I've, I've, I've given you the third level of trust, uh, you know, the first, which is the, uh, the, the trust that we have on whoever is creating that support structure to allow us to be able to focus on what matters the most. The trust that somebody is granting us to be able to make decisions and be productive, creative, and be able to apply our capability within that space of trust. And then the trust that we have in ourselves that actually will turn off that voice of doubt and will allow us to be able to achieve uh, peak performance. And the result of that, uh, no second guessing, you know, that is uh, liberation. That is acting without uh, hesitation. Uh, creativity becomes more free flowing. Risk taking becomes less frightening. And uh, just the, uh, the, the combination uh, lets us flow at a much, uh, much faster, much faster speed. So just to kind of, uh, you know, round off the, uh, the, the, the presentation, the holy grail of leadership is understanding that right balance of mutual trust that can provide uh, this space of autonomy uh, where people can flow. And this is just a blanket statement. Uh, if you want to, uh, to, to get into the, uh, the details of uh, what this looks like, uh, this is what we call the tripod of working relationships. So essentially uh, to be able to, uh, to provide uh, whoever it is that you're delegating something to, that space of autonomy, there are three things that need to happen in an optimal way with, uh, with trust. Uh, the first one is what we define as tasking. You know, how is it that we are defining the expectations uh, we want in terms of uh, the achievement? Uh, the second is the trusting element, which is what uh, decisions are we delegating? What are we trusting people to, uh, to, to, to do by themselves? And uh, then the, uh, the tending, uh, which is how we provide the, uh, the direction in the face of time, uh, change and uncertainty, because we, we, we pretty much task something, we can trust someone with, uh, with things, uh, but uh, the, the, the amount of time and the amount of change that can occur uh, within the tasking part, uh, can be tremendous. And uh, this is because sometimes we might think of tasking as something that's very practical. You know, I'm going to task you with bringing me a cup of coffee or, you know, the board of directors can go out and task the CEO uh, to execute a successful 10-year strategy. And then the tending becomes the, uh, the corporate governance uh, that makes sure that the, uh, the, the, the direction is maintained in the face of, of changes 
uncertainty and what we typically uh, describe as uh, as VUCA. Mastering the way that uh, that you effectively task, that you effectively tend, and you effectively trust is really one of the most powerful things that you can do as a leader. And if you can take something simple away, take a screenshot off this or get it off the, uh, the slide deck that we're going to send you. And whenever uh, you, uh, you, you're, you're working with others as a leader, as a subordinate or as a peer, go through these three basic questions. You know, let, let's make sure that the, the task is clear, you know, whether it's a simple task or it's a task that might take three years. Let's be clear on exactly what is being trusted. What are the limits of my authority in being able to complete the task that has been uh, delegated to me? And how is it that the tending is going to happen? How is it that, uh, that the, uh, the, the direction is, is going to be calculated? Because if that's, uh, if that's in place, what happens between tasking and, and, and tending is how we review what happens between tasking and trusting is how we allow others to exercise judgment. And what happens between tending and trusting is coherence. And uh, that's pretty much uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the holy grail of leadership and uh, one of the, the, the best kept secrets of uh, just effective management and effective leadership at, uh, at all levels. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, stop uh, with the, uh, the slides, the, the speaking, and uh, we can go into some of the questions and probably uh, dig deeper into some of the, uh, the concepts. Great. Well, thanks, Jose. That was fascinating. Um, we do have one question that popped up wondering if mm -hmm. uh, you're be, you would be willing to share the slides uh, with the attendees here or if there's any pro information there that you don't want out into the world. <laughs> oh, absolutely not. No, yeah, we can share the slides. And uh, yeah, that's an easy question. Perfect. So we, have more, we'll... we, we have more that are that easy. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Wolf Howard um, has a really interesting question. Um, that I would love for you to elaborate on. Um, mm -hmm. He says, you know, the mistake in is, is assuming that everyone has the same level of uncertainty tolerance, correct? And how, is, how, how do you manage that if you're dealing with employees that all have these different levels of uncertainty tolerance? How, mm -hmm. how do you manage that? You know, the, uh, the, the first, it is a mistake to assume that everybody has the same tolerance to uncertainty. And uh, I was I was actually having a, a discussion around this with a colleague uh, a couple of hours ago uh, about uh, this mistake being prevalent uh, when you when you've got people reporting into you that actually have the same title. You know, let's just say I'm a director of sales and I have six regional sales managers that report to me. And what we tend to do. And the mistake is assuming that, you know, you're going to be able to task each one of these regional sales managers in the same way, that you're going to be able to follow up with them in the same way, and that what we describe as the management horizon, which is really the management horizon is the, 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 the amount of time, the horizon in which any of us are comfortable acting and making decisions on our own without any type of validation. You know, you've got people that will seek validation from their boss, you know, almost every single day uh, in those sales roles, what happens sometimes. And, and when we talk to some of these directors of sales, you know, they'll tell me, oh, yeah, Joe calls me every single day at the end of the day and just kind of tells me what he did. And Peter, you know, I talk to Peter about once a week because that guy just likes working on his own and uh, he doesn't like to be uh, micromanaged. So depending on the tolerance of uncertainty, uh, if, if Peter were treated the same as Joe, then you should be able to feel that as a leader when you start noticing that Peter might be feeling that you're micromanaging and that you're just overly, you know, just like helicopter parenting, you know, just being on top of him and just watching his every step. On the flip side, if you treat Joe the same way that you treat Peter and if you look, if you call him just once a week, uh, Joe might feel that you're too detached. Uh, that you don't care enough, uh, that you don't pay attention, 
and that probably you know he's not as important than, as as somebody that uh, that you're speaking with uh, much more frequently. So there's there's no uh, there's no magic recipe to how uh, on how to uh, identify it, other than uh, you know the one-on-one -on -one communication and gauging. You know, but is 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 the individual. If I start loosening up the grip on 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 the uh, the, the tending part of the tripod. Uh, is that person comfortable or do they start feeling like uh, nobody's paying attention to them? If I start, if I start tightening the grip, uh, are they feeling that, uh, that they're being micromanaged? Uh, so there really is no, uh, no, uh, uh, no, no, no single answer, Howard. It's, uh, it's just a matter of, of feeling it with the, uh, with the interaction. And, you know, another thing that, uh, that has really been, you know, creating a, a, a very negative environment in, in organizational culture in, in, in the past decade or even more is this obsession with flat structures. Uh, because we think of flat structures as uh, eliminating hierarchy and eliminating necessary levels, uh, but sometimes they're necessary just because of, of uh, the, uh, the amount of trust and the amount of, of, of uh, interaction that people need. It's not a, a, a necessary hierarchy in roles or pay scales or anything. It's just that, you know what, if, if, if I can't uh, provide the level of, of uh, feedback that somebody needs on a daily basis, uh, then I need to make sure that there's somebody there that will be in the midpoint between my management horizon and management horizon of somebody else so that I don't feel that that person is too high maintenance, that that person doesn't feel that I'm just too detached uh, from what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I hope that answers the question, uh, Howard. And if not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll include my email and my phone number on the, uh, the presentation and seriously feel free to, to give me a call or even uh, just uh, request a one-on-one -on -one Zoom to, to dig into these things. Great, thanks for that. Um, there are a lot of questions coming through, which I know we're not gonna get to all of them, but there are a couple that have come through um, mm -hmm. in regards to communication and the importance mm -hmm. of communication. Um, so I'm gonna kind of combine a couple that have come in. Um, where uh -huh. does communication fit? Are there mm -hmm. best ways to communicate tasks, tending and trust? And what mm -hmm. role does a good communication play or what role does good communication play in building that trust? Oh, it's everything. Communication is everything because if you don't communicate, you're not going to be able to gauge. And, you know, in leadership, we very often see that the same mistake is made where leaders feel the need to communicate the grand vision. And that is essentially just a one-way communication. Because if you're really thinking not just about what you're communicating, but what the person is receiving, you can stand in front of a group of 30 people, say the same thing, and let's just say that I am the, uh, the, the CEO of Ford Motor Company, and I'm gonna go to Detroit and bring together a massive town hall meeting, and I'm gonna start, about, start talking about the electrification, the vision of Ford for the future. And you might have somebody that's working in the, uh, the, the electric vehicle uh, area that thinks, oh God, this is really exciting. You know, this is where we're going. Uh, this is gonna be great. Uh, and you also might have somebody that is a plant manager at the combustion engine plant that's thinking, oh, damn, we're gonna be out of a job in three years. You know, what's gonna happen? How am I gonna feed my children? Uh, you know, what, what, uh, what's going to happen to my supervisor? And then you might have somebody else just working off their own fears and not uh, analyzing communication from the perception of the person that's receiving it and thinking about how the, the, uh, the, the communication is going to trigger uncertainty is a killer. Because for one, uncertainty of this vision that means change is exciting. Another one might just be mildly concerned because he's thinking, huh, I'm in the F-150 group. So yeah, I guess there's going to be F-150s that are electrical and maybe some combustion engines. So I'm concerned because there might be a, a reduction in workforce. But the guy in, 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 in the uh, combustion engine motor factory might be really freaking out and stepping into this whole realm of, of fight or flight, just thinking, oh, as soon as I get home, I better start working on my resume. 
So communication is is everything, and the 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 focus should be on not what I'm saying, but what others are hearing. And and we over fantasize about what we're saying, and uh, do very little to put ourselves in the shoes of whoever is receiving the communication, and working hard at understanding what people are going to perceive. Great. Thanks for that. I just noticed another question that kind of a follow up to that is, are there examples, some examples of common mistakes that leaders make with the intent of improving trust that actually kind of backfire and have a negative effect? Oh, there's tons. And, and <laughs> it's a little bit of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the example of, of communication and the, uh, the, the, Typically, what uh, what is at the center of the fault, what what makes us do this, is is once again just thinking about what would be exciting for us, what we would consider uh, development, what would we consider our threshold of uh, of uncertainty, uh, versus what somebody else uh, considers uh, their 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 acceptable threshold uh, of uncertainty. Uh, we had this this. Uh, difficult conversation with, with one of the clients that we we're consulting with. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the leader of the group was just extremely competitive. I mean, she, she uh, in, 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 uh, in, in our feedback, she actually asked about, uh, you know, what we thought of her being the next Elon Musk, you know, that kind of, uh, this is what I aspire to, why can't I be the next Elon Musk, I'm going to push and work hard and 18 hour uh, work days, because I want to be the next Elon Musk. And uh, when we talked about the people that, that, that reported to her, uh, she said, well, you know what? I, I want the best for them. So what I'm going to do is push them hard so that they can achieve as much as I can achieve. There's no reason why they, uh, they shouldn't be able to do it. And then we talked to the people that report to her and, and they're like, no, man, we just, you know, we just want to come to work. We want to be able to work out. I'm turning for a marathon. You know, that's what, uh, that, that's what satisfaction means to me. That's what my ambition is. So the, uh, the big mistake uh, is, is assuming that uh, everybody wants the same thing that you do, that everybody uh, has the same uh, threshold for uncertainty and uh, that everybody wants to walk in your shoes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit surprising uh, what you can find out if you actually uh, lean out and uh, the concept of, of leaning out uh, could, could essentially be a, a whole uh, other presentation. Uh, but, you know, when we get started in the corporate world, everybody tells us you have to lean in, you have to push, you have to uh, don't wait for things to happen, you make things happen. So we're always leaning in. And what happens when we're leaning in is that when we occupy that space, we're using the space, we're not allowing others to lean in and actually step into that space. So practicing uh, good communication of uh, not always leaning in not being afraid of silence, being able to lean out. Many times, just 10 minutes of silence is what a shy person might need to be able to convince themselves that they're going to speak about what they've been thinking all throughout your conversation. So the space is to be able to allow people to, to, to lean in themselves and be able to, uh, to communicate is really what's going to allow you to listen. Fantastic. Um, and we are coming up on, on our time, but I just wanted to see if we have time for this last question, because I know that, um, you know, especially the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time on, on Zoom. We've spent a lot of time mm -hmm. in meetings. Um, and one of the questions is, what is your suggestion for reaching flow if you're constantly attending meetings? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever I tell you, I think it's going to be hypocritical uh, because I, I, I can't get off my, uh, my own Zoom train. Uh, but I think that the, uh, the, uh, what I just mentioned about being able to lean out uh, is important because even with the, 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 the most critical part of Zooms is that we've made meetings just uh, productivity obsessed. And uh, I, I bet you that if this were a Zoom meeting with all of you in, in here, if I went silent, for five seconds, I mean, just five seconds, then in a regular meeting room, we'd all feel this normal. Everybody would be like, 
what is my sound not working uh you know what why are they silent you know it, it just feels much more awkward because we're mentally in this mood of just uh, increasing the uh the, the productivity uh, but it's something that we need to manage. We we need to fight this urge to have uh, 10, 12 uh, Zoom meetings scheduled uh, because it really does not allow us to be able to assimilate and 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 think and feel and uh, most of all listen. And uh, again, I'm being very very hypocritical because if there's somebody here that works with me, they're they're actually thinking, yeah, dude, trying to get on your calendar is no easy task. You know, you're not paying attention. Uh, but uh, that's the ideal. That that's what I would want to be able to do. Uh, you know, liberate the calendar a bit more, uh, because there's no time for any type of uh, spontaneous conversation. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the last time somebody just called me directly and I actually picked up, you know, it must have been a few weeks ago. Right. Well, Jose, it is time. I want to be respectful because you do have a busy calendar, and I'm sure our attendees do as well. But I wanted to thank you so much for this amazing presentation, all of this insight. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to share with the conscious capitalism community. Um, thank you to the attendees for being here with us at all those great questions. We will be sending out a copy of the recording and the slides to everyone in attendance and everyone who registered. Um, folks who are interested, we do have other sessions coming up, other public virtual gatherings. Um, I dropped in the chat the link to our website. Um, we appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you at our next gathering. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.